I'm Sam Hector. I work for IBM Security in our corporate strategy department. And it's my team's job to inform and occasionally transform the future direction of the IBM security business. And today is one of those transformational moments in our industry. The event is called the future of cybersecurity. And the future of cybersecurity is intrinsically linked to the future of technology. How we can bring productivity gains to defenders using new technology how attackers are going to change the threat landscape we face based on new technology and opportunities presented to them, and how we as defenders need to treat these new platforms and technologies as new and unique attack surfaces to protect going forwards. So I'm going to take that, um, all three of those, in relation to the advent of generative AI for you today. But let's start with a recognition of where we are and how far we've come up until this point. Because AI and security is not a new concept, despite the fact that everyone is currently talking about it. We've been using it for years, and it's in real use at clients, making a big impact today. When we talk about AI, we actually mean a series of subsets of, co of concepts. The overarching concept is artificial intelligence, which is how can machines perform tasks that would normally require human intelligence to perform. Within that, and by the way, we've been using AI in security since the mid-1980s to do things um, like uh, create rule sets for intrusion protection systems based upon observed behavior. That was something called expert systems back in the 1980s that would perform that job. But since then, we've evolved significantly to use machine learning and deep learning. And currently, when we talk about AI and security use cases today, often it's using ML and deep learning models. But in the future, I'll come on to how we're going to utilize foundation models and the advent of generative AI to have significant advantages for defenders as well. So for those of you that don't know IBM security, we specialize primarily in three different areas. Threat detection and response with our QRadar suite of technologies, data security with our Guardian suite of technologies, and identity and access management with our Verify suite of technologies. And I'll take each one in turn and tell you an example of how we're utilizing AI today before I come on to the exciting roadmap stuff of tomorrow. In threat detection and response, we can automate much of a tier one analyst's workflow because any time an alert is received by the SIM, QRadar, we can use AI and automation to mine for further context and then perform a risk analysis to say how risky is this alert to this organization. And we repeat that cyclically until we can come back to the analyst with a timeline view of exactly what's happened, mapped to the MITRE attack framework with recommended response actions to really accelerate their and give a head start on their remediation. In data security, what we often observe is that attackers take the path of least resistance. They're fundamentally lazy. And we know that about attackers and observing their behavior. And what that means is often they won't try and exploit a convoluted vulnerability chain to get access to your data. They'll simply compromise a privileged user's credentials and log in as an admin. And so what we do to defend against that is observe the behavior of your admin users using machine learning models and then signal risk early so that we can detect breaches even in the absence of rule-based detections being triggered. In identity and access management, what we're doing is taking that same risk analysis approach and applying it to every single user login attempt. So as soon as a user attempts to log in, and this can be consumer cohorts, it can be workplace cohorts, when they attempt to log into a system, we analyze the risk that that user presents and adapt the login flow accordingly. If they look really um, risk-free, then we can give them a seamless login flow. If they look a little bit more risky, we can challenge them for additional authentication like pass keys. And in one organization, this decreased the MFA challenge rate by 15 times. You can imagine the amount of frustration we've relieved from their users in that flow. So that's how we're using it today, making a real impact. Here's how we're going to use generative AI in our threat detection and response roadmap tomorrow. By the way, we have demos of some of this stuff on our stand, the new exciting stuff. We also can get hands on with all of those technologies that I've just mentioned. So come and visit IBM in the hall behind you. 
Um, so we are using generative AI in, um, to advance security use cases in the future. We're utilizing our Watson X technology and IBM are leading the market in the uh, deployment and development and governance of these new generative AI models using our Watson X platform. But one thing I do want to mention before I come onto the roadmap is we're doing this very, very differently to some other vendors. And I'd love people to disagree with me on this, so come and have a chat about it afterwards. But my fundamental belief is that bolting on a chat interface to every single point product and solution in security, just because generative AI and large language models have come about, is actually a bad thing for analysts and is going to reduce productivity in the long run. We need a holistic platform approach that is open and interoperable rather than a chat interface to every security solution that you have. Else you're just going to end up ta task switching for days and not get anything done. So that's why we're taking a more considered approach and aren't leaping to do that like many other vendors are doing currently. What we're going to use it for in the next few months are automating reporting. So analysts spend a huge amount of time creating summaries of incidents for different audiences, technical, non-technical, leadership. We're going to do that at the click of a button using large language models to generate that for them. We're also going to use it to accelerate threat hunting. Analysts have to get up to speed on new systems and learn complex query syntax on each individual system to get the data they need out of them. Generative AI is great at taking natural language inputs and converting that into correctly formatted syntax. So you can get data out of security tools as quickly as writing a sentence rather than a complex query. We're also using generative AI to interpret machine data. So this could be log files and saying, what exactly happened on this server? Tell me in human readable language what this log means. Or it could be a command line prompt. So take this prompt that I've seen um, executed on a server or a laptop and tell me exactly what behavior that command line prompt triggers. We're going to use generative AI to do that for analysts. And then finally, we're going to curate threat intelligence that's most relevant to organizations and the context and threat landscape they're operating in. All of this is coming really soon. Come and talk to us about it. But let's look at how generative AI is going to influence the threat landscape that we face in two different ways. Because attackers are going to target generative AI as a new type of attack surface. It's got unique um, attack vectors that we need to defend against, like model extraction, inference, evasion, poisoning, and prompt injection. We need to uh, do threat detection and response in new ways to defend against this. As you heard previously, prompt injection can drop the defenses of large language models. They're often biased in favor of obeying the user, even if that means disobeying rules and guidelines that have been almost hard-coded into them previously. And that can be really bad for privacy and reputation contexts here. And also, we've seen attackers, both in theory and in practice, upload malicious models to open marketplaces like Hugging Face. Because you can uh, put hidden back doors in models that will trigger behavior at a future date. And you can also use models to deploy malware. You can hide malware in the weights and balances of machine learning models. And when they're used in the software supply chain by organizations, that malware is then deployed. But also, attackers are going to utilize generative AI for their own gain as well. So, what we're going to see in the short to medium term, we believe, is that generative AI won't fundamentally change the types of attacks that we're seeing in the wild, but it will scale them significantly and lower the barriers to entry to lower skilled attackers to do more complex things that they weren't able to do previously based upon generative AI giving them a helping hand. The one thing we do think is going to change in the short to medium term, or one of the things that we think is going to change, is that phishing is going to become much more targeted at a much greater scale. Because LLMs are great at customizing content given a few short prompts and information about a user. So phishing is going to become more convincing. But fundamentally, the way we deal with that problem isn't going to change. It's going to be through detection and training like we've always practiced. But also business email compromise attacks, which were previously really highly targeted, 
are now going to utilize generative audio and video techniques to become even more convincing. And that's going to necessitate new approaches, which I'd love to tell you about and talk about later. But also, um, attackers using generative AI will be able to adapt to defensive strategies quicker. They're going to be able to enumerate vulnerabilities in platforms, SaaS apps, and services much, much faster based upon utilizing gen generative AI and automation to do so. OK, so in light of all of this, what do we need to do? Over the last uh, couple of months, I've worked with my team to co-author a security for AI framework, which I'm going to show you a very, very high-level summary of over the next two slides and four minutes. If you need the full thing, um, then come and see me afterwards. I'd love to email you a copy. We're also authoring a white paper that I can put you on the list for when that releases next month. So. What's useful when you're looking at new attack surfaces is to break this down into what are attackers going to target. So let's break down the chain, the DevOps cycle of AI, from data collection and handling through to model development and training through to inference, live usage, and deployment. How are attackers going to break this or attempt to break this at every stage? During data collection and handling, they're going to target your sensitive data stores. And we've seen data is often the lowest hanging fruit and very easy for attackers to gain access to and manipulate. That can be bad news for the way that they can change the behavior of AI models, particularly trained on uh, closed source information that's private to your organization. In the development and training process, they're going to try and target these new vulnerabilities in black box applications that we fundamentally don't fully understand how they work yet, even, even to this day. And then finally, in live use, they're going to attempt to hijack the behavior or reduce the performance of a model using new attack vectors like the ones that I've mentioned uh, previously. So how do we as defenders need to cope with this? This is our security for AI framework. At a very high level, there's more detail behind each of these boxes. So yeah, as I said, come and talk to me afterwards. Um, under the data collection and handling phase, you need to implement data security best practices like encryption, redaction, masking, role-based access control, and do all the things that we've been doing but firms have been publicly failing to do for many, many years. Under securing the model, you need to implement good DevSecOps practices. And under securing the usage, you need to do threat detection and response in new ways to detect these new types of attack and also make sure your models are performing to the standards that you require and are doing so without bias or compromise. Fundamentally, underneath that, you still need to secure the infrastructure as we've been doing for years and years, but it's worth saying these applications still run on the same infrastructure, whether on-prem or in the cloud, and we need to secure that infrastructure in the way that we've been doing for years. And then finally, my final point would be that IBM are leading the way in establishing AI governance. And I've not yet mentioned regulation, but clearly Biden put out um, a, a public statement last week. The EU are working very hard to get the uh, AI Security Act published, probably making significant progress between now and December, we hear. Um, and to stay ahead of this emerging space and to make sure you're AI applications are adhering to regulation and are compliant, we are leading the way with Watson X governance, which also integrates some security controls in there as well. Okay, it's a really exciting field. I hope you've learned something, and I hope that really brief summary has been engaging for you. Uh, please do come and see us on the stand. I'd love to show you what we're doing and talk about the future too. Thank you.